place all loose items in the pouch in front of you. And have a safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. To love Disney parks is to also love good design. The immersive nature of the parks depend on it, and while many may just take it in without much thought, others are looking at every single detail. Today's guests, Rob Yeo and Andy Sinclair Harris, are those kind of people. Both amazing designers and Disney nerds, Rob and Andy have found their place inside of Disney fan culture. Rob is known for his amazing Disney-inspired designs and collaborations with other Disney fans, and Andy spent several years as an Imagineer working on Hong Kong Disneyland. These two were kind enough to chat with me about being British Disney nerds, working on designs for liquor and Time Lords, and their brand new podcast, The Sorcerer's Lounge. All that and more is coming right up on DreamFinders. Rob Yeo and Andy Sinclair Harris, welcome to DreamFinders. Thanks for coming on, guys. I really appreciate it. Hello. Thank you very much for asking us. I've seen the guests you've had before, so I feel like uh, I feel very privileged that you asked us to come on. Well, yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, in these hallowed halls. Thank you very much. <laughs> these hallowed halls. You make it sound like it's Hogwarts. Um, Wait, are you in a hallway? Yeah. I, I'm no, this is, I, I should be doing it in a hallway. I'm in a hall. Closet. Yeah, well, you guys in a hall. I'm in a hallway. Yeah, I'm in a hallowed hallway. So I thought that was where we we're supposed oh, to meet. Okay, now gosh. I know where I'm by myself. Okay, yeah, right, you're the only one in a hallway. I, uh, <laughs> huh? I should have, I should have found myself in a hallway. I, you know, my study is kind of a hallway. It's a little small. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, I brought you both on today because you can already tell uh, these two have a good banter. Um, and not only are they both first class Disney parks fans and designers, you have a new podcast uh, together called the Sorcerer's Lounge Podcast. How did you guys come up with this idea? Why did you, take a, that, you know, how did you end up um, deciding I want to throw my hat in the Disney podcasting ring? I can't remember back that far. How many years was it? It was probably, like, <laughs> I think it was 1970. We said, I think podcasts are going to be a big thing yeah. uh, in the future. We should do something. And then, you know, work gets in the way. And uh, <laughs> 2020 rolls around. And we said, now is the time. Now is the best time. Um, but how long have we been talking about doing this? Well, the Civil War was in its final year, and <laughs> I, I remember <laughs> the two brothers. No, no, uh, it was uh, yeah. Um, it's been at least a year, and I think it's pre- well, yeah, uh, probably maybe. Oh my goodness, I think a year and a half. That um, yeah, Rob and I have known each other for a while, and kind of you know through the, through the internet kind of sphere, and just have kind of got on really well, and always talked about doing something together like that and it just it just we both found a commonality that we both wanted to if we wanted to talk about something in a way that wasn't really done and so like rob said we put it on the back burner and work and families have got in the way and finally we both said right let's make this happen and and actually physically recorded it and it was so much fun that was great yeah because we were thinking we love talking about themed entertainment design and theme parks and to my knowledge i hadn't encountered a podcast which was solely talking about that like usually it's news or history or things like that and they might touch on uh, the design element but there wasn't one dedicated to that so we thought that's a space we could jump into and just try and come up with something fun yeah and and again we, we both kind of wanted to keep it really um natural and and kind of conversational we both that's why you know i think it was robert came up with the name the sorcerer's lounge so it's almost imagining that this is sat in a lounge you're kind of sat with us at this bar this fantastic fantastical bar talking about these things in a kind of really friendly conversation where you can kind of tune into this conversation easily so that was it wasn't meant to be a lecture or kind of a history lesson and we, we kind of didn't want to get too deep into too much of the details it wanted to be like a really fun conversation between the two of us yeah, and I think that's what's so interesting because you both come from a designing background and, and and I think a lot of people can sort of, I think there's a difference between like loving something and loving how it looks and then also sort of knowing why you love it um, from that design perspective. Uh, and even with your first episode, you guys really kind of get into the conversation about uh, Tomorrowlands uh, throughout you know the world and, and, and sort of the minutia of not only what puts them together and, and, and that sort of stuff, but the evolution of each of them. And I, and I think what I really liked too, was because you guys bring an international perspective. You're, you're both from the UK. 
Um, and I'm always, always fascinated um, by the UK's relationship with Disney, uh, especially Disney mm-hmm. World, uh, because, you know, and this is something I think I brought up in this podcast before, but I, for people who don't live in Florida, they don't know that, like, our grocery stores have a British food section in the international <laughs> yes. aisle. That's how popular uh, Disney World is with the UK. Um, yeah. And so what Colonialism still lives. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and you know, what are your experiences, both of you growing up uh, with Disney, um, both with, you know, the films and all that and the parks? Uh, Andy, why don't you start? What was your experiences? Um, I think I remember one of my first Disney films being, um, I think it might have been uh, Pinocchio and it was in a re-release in a UK cinema. And as much as I loved it, I did. I was more terrified than love <laughs> for this thing. It was it was terrifying. I remember Pinocchio laying face down in the water and, and, you know, Pleasure Island and it was, you know, the cigars. But I think that was my first cinematic kind of foray into Disney. Um, but then it was something that was always quite present, but obviously not to the extent it's present in the US. I mean, mm-hmm. in the US, it is a, you know, it's it's the lifeblood. It really is something that's kind of in, in, in kind of uh, in, in enshrined i guess really for us in the uk it's always been like a uh, an investment sort of that you'd have to go into but the parks disney world was the first ever park i went to before paris because this was um before paris had opened so it was you know that's how long ago that was so went to disney world and was just completely you know mesmerized by epcot and all the rides at epcot so it was for me it was just a life-changing experience going to disney world Uh, what age were you when you first had that opportunity um, I th- I'm pretty sure I was, I was about, I think it was about nine. I think when I went eight or nine, uh, I think I just turned nine. And so that was why it, it was quite a formative age for me because it was the age where it's like that, uh, bed of the broomsticks, you know, the age of not believing, you know, that kind of song that <laughs> it's like, you're just at that age where you know how things are done. You're not quite sure how they're done, but you know, it's an, it's an artifice. It's not real, but you really enjoy that artifice. So I was on Spaceship Earth and I was looking down at the track, looking to see how it was working. And I would, I knew there were animatronics. I wasn't that young. Where I was like, oh, this is, ama- this is amazing. It was amazing, but I was deconstructing it in my mind from a, from a place of like, how have they done that? And, but I hadn't quite formulated in my head as to wouldn't it be great to do this as a job but uh, yeah i was probably about i'm sure i was about nine when i first went to disney and this would have been 90 91 92 i think mm, yeah the classic kind of eisner years for sure yeah disney decades yeah rob what about you um i think i'd always loved art and so i've been a big fan of uh disney animated movies and i think that was my ambition growing up that first of all i wanted to be an animator because I love the idea of that and we went to I think the first Disney park was Disneyland Paris in 1994 so I was six and then uh, after that my family we were going pretty regularly to Walt Disney World and I was just absolutely hooked and obsessed with it because I'd always come home from our trips and be sketching up new rides or designing my own park or something like that especially trying to come up with a ride for the UK pavilion because it always was a sore spot that (laughs) we were one of the few countries that had absolutely zip. Mm. You still do. (laughs) And it looks like it will be that way for the future. (laughs) It feels personal at this point. It does. Um, But then um, went from just purely enjoying it to getting more into the behind the scenes part. So every time we'd go, if there was an Imagineering book, I'd buy that. So I still have this collection of books I've just amassed because I just pour over all the artists and the behind the scenes and how they came up with it. And that's really what got me unhealthily interested in uh, theme parks and not just enjoying it, but going, picking it apart, saying, why does this work? Why does this not work? And then eventually carrying that through to a career. Hmm. You know, I hadn't even thought about that, but I, I'm curious from the both of you. I don't think I've ever spoken to someone about having a pavilion kind of made after their country um what Mm. when you look at the uk pavilion in general terms and what would i guess what some would probably even call stereotypical terms um what's it i mean what's it like for you is it is it the equivalent of a of a really fake facade or does it vibe anything when it comes to feeling like home (laughs) i think it's pretty good actually like it's it's obviously a bit too clean and shiny <laughs> but i think w- one of the things it captures is because there's so little room in this country everything's squished up against each other and you've got things from all time periods sort of shoulder to shoulder because 
it's very rare that something gets completely knocked down so you might have a castle next to a brand new store next to a big tudor house so it kind of captures that like all the different architectural styles in one street so every time i looked at it i think it's it's pretty good like i think it kind of looks like maybe a photoshop postcard of reality but it's not a million miles from the truth Mm. andy what do you think I, I agree with that. I mean, it's it's not inaccurate. I mean, when I go there, you know, I mean, when I used to live in Florida and it, it, going there did feel like coming home. So everything is accurate. I'm mean, obviously this is imagineering. So the buildings are accurate. The the number of chimneys are good. But um, as Rob, it, it's just like a kind of uh, it's very much a. Um, almost like a smorgasbord of, of, of England if you took one piece out of everything. So there's there's a Tudor, there's medieval there, and then there's kind of like a, a typical English pub. So every, everything is very representative. It's like a it's like a dish that you would get if you went to an English thing at a, a restaurant and someone said, just give me one of everything. It feels like <laughs> that. So, you know, but um, as, as Rob said, it's kind of clean and it's 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 the it's almost the Dick Van Dyke Mary Poppins accent. It's just it's it's somewhat accurate, but there there are some inaccuracies. But I mean, I love it. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful pavilion. I think we did quite well actually out of all the pavilions because it's quite charming, and it has that it has the charm of England in there. I think, which is the most important thing. Yeah, but we didn't even get a three hundred and sixty degree show. I mean, come on, that's oh, like seriously, yeah, throw us a barn. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree with Rob. I mean, when we used to go when we were younger, that was the thing. I felt like, why didn't we get that? And uh, you know, even even if there was kind of a boat that went by in World Showcase Lagoon and just threw tea off the side every fifteen minutes, you know, <laughs> I think there'd be some kind of entity, something. But you know, there, there's nothing. I, I just did feel aggrieved that there wasn't some kind of three hundred and sixty show or um, a ride. And then as the older you get, and you realise there were some things in development which have never happened you just feel even more like oh come on there must be yeah, something stupid. but if anyone at disney is uh listening yeah. i still have plans <laughs> for an attraction which is kind of mr toad but you're riding in a london black cab oh so you know contact me mm-hmm. after this and we'll get it going <laughs> yeah it's not like they didn't have <laughs> eric idol's number they could have easily done a 360 show <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yes he's always around that. so you know he he's, always, he's always for available. scale so yeah um let me ask you, though, because one of you, of course, said that your first experience was at Disney World and one of them was at Disneyland Paris. For British culture, what's the clear favorite? Because clearly one's a little closer, but there's less. So, you know, how do people balance that in their lives? Which ones do you guys prefer? I would say I prefer um, Walt Disney World. And that's not there's nothing against France at all. I mean, Disneyland Park, the, for the for people listening who've actually been to the you know original Disneyland Paris Park, it's stunning. It's mm-hmm. it's incredible. I mean, Tony Baxter team did just the best job on a castle park there. But um, Studios Park is a little bit lacking. And it, there is just something that isn't the quintessential Disney experience that I found in California and Florida that is that is there. So um, like I said, for all of Paris's charm and its uniqueness, and it's probably to do with Walt Disney World being the first theme park that I went to. So you kind of mm. imprint that emotional um, sort of um, fantasy to it, I guess. That would so that would be my favorite. I think I agree with Andy. I think sort of for the same reasons. The way, the way I think of it is all, all Disney parks or resorts have kind of this bubble. And, you know, you've got the real world and then you're on Disney property and you're inside this magic bubble where everything's clean and everyone's friendly to each other, generally, you hope. And then in Walt Disney World, that bubble is absolutely ginormous because when you drive underneath mm-hmm. that massive archway, you're in it and you can start enjoying yourself. Um, Disneyland Paris, for me, that bubble is just around that initial park. Even the shopping district, I wouldn't consider part of it, even the hotels. So we went last Christmas and I love that park to pieces because it's such a work of art. So much detail went into that like nothing was overlooked and it's a beautiful park to enjoy but the overall experience like the hotel we stayed at was rubbish the transportation was rubbish the the equivalent of downtown disney was awful because they had eight restaurants each with a different theme all with the same menu of (laughs) chips chicken nuggets burgers i think we nearly got scurvy (laughs) if we hadn't found uh, like a pre-packet a lemon (laughs) (laughs) just found a lemon on the floor (laughs) yeah in our diet coke mcdonald's but yeah, it's not the same atmosphere. I don't know. Well, it could be the weather because that's obviously a massive factor. It's hard to be, have a smile on your face when it's freezing cold mm. and permanent rain. But, um, yeah, no, Florida wins out against Paris, unfortunately. Well, and that, of course, I think brings up, I think is a sore spot for from a design perspective, which is, which is of course, uh, Studios Park in Paris, um, which I don't know why people don't love. I, I'm a big fan of concrete, so... 
Um, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, no, it feels like all the uh, all, all of that love and talent and and um, artistic experience they they put so much of it into the the original park. They had none left for poor studios. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like the person in your family who's you know got so much potential, and you keep thinking they're about to get their act together and go on the straight and narrow and they've cleaned up and they're applying for jobs and they've got a suit and then they screw it up again and like, oh for goodness we were all counting on you You're so close yeah you had cinema this time Jeep, i'm gonna yeah. change I, I just need 20 bucks this time i'm gonna change I promise <laughs> like, I, I did such a good job on ratatouille please please yeah <laughs> can't you remember cinema g i mean come on look i did good i've been good yeah um, i'm pulling you guys yeah <laughs> um let me ask you about other british parks though because i am i am equally fascinated by british parks only because for two reasons one i know nothing about them um and it's fun okay. to suddenly go you're, you're the lucky one you know yeah that's what you're hearing but it's, it's fun to be on youtube and go i i don't know this like i have no no connection to any of this and finding history about different parks i hear names like alton towers thrown about um but i just assume that a lot of british theme parks would be sort of a six flags equivalent i could be wrong um, how I accurate wish. is that description? I think that's pretty on the money because th there's this quote from, I don't know if you know John Wardley, mm. but he's this sort of legendary figure in uh, British theme parks. But his opinion was that English people or British people wouldn't go for a Disney world over here because we know it's all fake. We're so cynical. We'd never buy into, you know, this fantasy of being, you know, in a pirate ship or a Wild West train. So you just got to give them the roller coaster, let them have the, you know, blank thrill of that, and then you're not going to get any more than that, which always feels like a cop out to me. Because, like as you said, how many people from this country mm. go to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the other parks abroad? For me, I think that, and I've said this before, that someone asked me once what the difference between you know Disney World and the kind of the UK theme parks were, and I said that for my money, that there aren't any theme parks in the UK. There mm. are amusement parks, sure. but. The theme park to me is a different genre completely. I mean, having as someone who actually works in the industry and considers it, you know, to be somewhat of an art form to design for theme parks, because when I do anything for, you know, Disney theme park or, or whatever, it's something that I really cherish and, and take pride in. And, and there is something that you are completely immersed in, whatever that overriding whether it's story or placemaking, whatever it is, you, you're giving your design aesthetic to it. Whereas in the UK, as Rob just said, it tends to be about the roller coasters and, you know, and, and the perception is that the UK kind of audience doesn't want that or wouldn't get that. And I mean, I when I was, when we used to go to Disney World when we were kids, people would say to me, oh, why do you go to Disney World? It's all fake. And how do you get over that fakeness? And it's like, what's fake about it because you know although there's you know the artificiality of it but what's fake about it because these things are completely made of stone and concrete and they're as real as you can imagine i mean yeah okay you're being told a, a story but it's exactly the same as picking up a book from a shelf and reading that and then reading another one it's just it's that same level of immersion so i think that it's just to do with business it's just to do with a level of immersion I, I don't think anyone from the uk has been bold enough yet to invest the kind of money that it would take on on the level of a a Walt Disney World or a Universal Studios to spend, you know, $50 million on rock work alone to make you feel like you're in, you know, Pandora. No one wants to do that over here. And, uh, you know, there is, there's the perception that there isn't the appetite. And I think that it comes back to that old adage that when people are thirsty in the desert, they'll drink the sand. Mm. It's, it's a little bit like that. I think that <laughs> the UK, the UK audience have been drinking sand for a long time and that's all they know. <laughs> I mean, you guys always yeah. have Blackpool, so there's something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the thing is, like, annoyingly, at these parks, you will have an individual ride that could be, you know, themed or at least trying. But the thing is, you need to have, to get that total immersion, you can't have any contradictions. Mm -hmm. Like, you need it to be a 360 degree thing where you feel like you're in the middle of this fantastical mm -hmm. story. And unfortunately, they might get it right for, you know, most of an attraction, like you'll get 80% there, but you're still in a land that's not really themed. You can look across and there's something that's from a completely different world there, or, uh, you know, it's just not that level of detail you'd expect a really good theme park. So you can suspend your disbelief. And I think, yeah, what I've experienced what Andy was saying about you get family members or friends who go to Disneyland and say, Oh, I didn't like it. It was so fake. 
but you know you don't come out of a movie going it's like oh that was really fake because i mean that guy you know could fly and then that exactly. guy had magic yeah. powers like you yeah. know ridiculous i mean is it connected in some way with the fact that you know there are actual real castles in, in your entire country like uh, is is it just that like is it the fact that there's a there's some sort of there is a lot of taking from european european models for fantasy and and sort of castle designs and things like that that it, when that becomes the thing that you oh i don't know like you know pass by or what not castles but you know even that kind of design um you know you pass by it on your way to the grocery store or whatever like is it just it, it doesn't feel real is that kind of the the connection that people can't make I think part of it is obviously for, for a theme park to be really successful, it needs to take you into places you could never go in your everyday life. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be factored in, you know, the geographical location of your park, because it's true in this country, uh, castles are sort of a common site on the horizon. So you probably wouldn't want to build, you know, a castle in your park because there's no wow value there. You could go and see one somewhere else for free. And they had that in Paris as well, because they were saying, you know we have castles mm -hmm. which is why their one had to lean so heavily into fantasy and fairy tales to stand out from that so i don't think it's that because if you pick the right themes and it's things which are kind of on the opposite scale to what we'd consider ordinary to us then it would work that makes sense um let me ask you rob because i andy you mentioned how um your kind of love of Disney on a more technical level started with Spaceship Earth. Rob, what was it for you? Do you remember a moment uh, in a park that sort of sparked your interest in, in, in taking you from being a fan of Disney to being obsessed with theme park design? Um, the one I always come back to is Ellen's energy adventure of all things, because that ride blew my mind mm. when I was a kid. Because if you think about it for someone who's never been on it before, you go into the first room, which is sort of, a cinema and you're watching screens and like, okay this is cool then the doors open and you walk into an even bigger theater and you get into the carts and think okay right it's going to be like a cinema then the room starts rotating which is another mind-blowing thing you see another screen and then your seats start driving out and then you're suddenly in a prehistoric time period so all of those things back to back those surprises and those reveals that was one of the earliest things i remember thinking this is absolutely insane I love this and I want to find out how they do it. Hmm. Yeah, I totally, I, that, that when those doors open, uh, on that diorama and it's just sort of shaded in silhouette and slowly like the sun comes up, like to this day that gives me chills cause it was just so, <sighs> so well done. Um, yes. did you both grow up in artistic families or did you come into drawing and, and illustration and concept art in a different way? I, I, my grandfather was a film editor for the BBC over here and really, really good at it. And um, I wish I could do more editing because I, I would love to feel like that runs through my mm. veins and I was really good at it like he was. But um, he used to illustrate and um, do almost like kids books, illustrations, beautiful watercolor illustrations for kids books. Um, and um, we have completely, we had the completely most opposite styles that he was completely meticulous and, and laborious with things and would draw these wonderful things. And mine's much more furious and fast. <laughs> and that, um, that was my kind of foray into artistry was with, with my granddad. What sort of shows did he edit? He edited uh, Doctor Who. Um, That's burying the, the lead, by the way. If 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 your grandfather <laughs> your grandfather edits Doctor Who, you just say Doctor Who at the beginning. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's gonna be the title of the episode now. Interview with grandson of Doctor Who editor. <laughs> he, I, I didn't even know this because I, I was a, I was a fan of Doctor Who when I was younger, and literally it was something we didn't know about till we were much older. And he just said, "Oh yeah, I did the laser effect for the Tomb of the Cybermen episode." And we were like, <laughs> "What?" <laughs> and then. You know, because you never watch the credits of Doctor Who when you're young, or any TV show when you're younger. And, of course, it rolls up and there is his name. I'm like, what? You know, literally mind blown. So, yeah, he was he was an editor on that. And he also worked on um, with, you know, you must guys must know David. Well, mm -hmm. Rob would know, of but uh, no, uh, David Attenborough. He used to do editing for his um, show Horizon and mm -hmm. things like that. So, uh, yeah, oh, wow. he was he was. Yeah, he was amazing. Wonder, wonderful man. Lovely man. And um like as i say really amazing editor when i've now looked back on his again it's it's a, it's a shame i didn't get to talk more about it because obviously he passed away when i was a little bit younger obviously but when i look back on his work now i can really appreciate his his artistry what about you rob what was your family experience like artistic wise what are, no one in my family is sort of a pencil and 
pen kind of artist but i'd say i definitely got a creative streak from my mum because she she's sort of very into uh theming i guess Mm. because i remember we used to have this family business which my grandma owned and then passed down to my mum which was uh holiday flats so that's kind of like if you imagine like a mini hotel with eight rooms where people could sort of stay for a week uh so we had this and then when my mum took it over she had this whole vision of how it was going to be nautical themed so we ended up going through all these antique shops on the coast trying to find fishing nets and ships bells and uh (laughs) steering wheels and all these things and then decorated the entire place and each room had a different themed name so the one at the top was the crow's nest and then you had the anchor at the very bottom. Nice. So I think that's that's theme design. I mean, my mum was probably tackling it mostly from like an interior design point of view, but that definitely stuck with me. Mm. So I definitely think I've definitely got some genetics from her in those regards. I've never met your mum, but I love your mum. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andy, you actually got a degree in theater design. So was theater a big part of your life growing up and, and, and was that something that you were a part of at an early age? Yes, it was actually because um, we were really lucky because um, my dad actually used to do what they call like a, almost like accounts management for um, for a, a large pharmaceutical firm. And one of the parts of his job, which is just crazy, was to kind of um, entertain these huge big accounts and their and their kind of various management staff. And occasionally he would get to do something that was just kind of pure fun. So he would take them for like a weekend at some hotel or something, or he, you know, he would and he would get to take them to um, the West End. They would get to go do shows. And every now and then he would be able to take us along to that. So we saw um, Phantom of the Opera, things like that, Les Miserables, all these things in the West End. So lucky to see them. And again, I think it just it's funny because when you see these things at such a formative age, I mean, the things that I saw were kind of, a, a, you know, a few months or a year apart and they just kind of sit within your psychosis and, and just form a, an idea. The fact that, oh, yes, this thing that's being shown in front of me, other people, you know, men and women have created this thing and I'm really enjoying what I'm watching. And I wonder if I could be a part of that. So it was um, it kind of theatre was my first foray into it I, I wanted to get into that I kind of did it at school as well but I think it was always in service of wanting to become an imagineer I think the fact that um, learning to look at a text and how you would read that text and then translate that into three dimensions is just the basis you know telling a story mm-hmm. in three dimensions is the whole basis of imagineering. Rob um, you did graphic design in college um, what was your adventure into that did you did you always want to do that or was there other um, artistic or even non-artistic uh, goals that you had uh, coming into college that you decided, now nah, I'll, I'll stick with graphic design. Well, actually, at university, I did international business in Germany. Oh. So I, I didn't do anything to do That's with That's fascinating. For some reason, art. I just assumed wow. you were uh, in graphic design in college. But uh, Oh, thank you. Well, I'll take that yeah, as a compliment. Yeah, and usually but, my <laughs> research is, yeah, you, you, I feel like I do a good job of kind research. you a good career I, out of it. Yeah, so, yeah. You, that's what I, I for some yeah. I talk, I, the one time I assume I get it wrong, you know? Why don't you work for Mercedes-Benz or something? (laughs) (laughs) So the thing is, because when it it came time to apply for university, at that point in time, I loved doing art, but I didn't like studying it because it amounted to you be told what material Mm. to use, what subject to draw, not really be given anything beyond that. So it would just be hours of uh, bring in something and just sketch it for four weeks, which didn't appeal to me in the slightest. So even though I loved it, I thought I can just do this in my spare time. And what I was good at was business. And uh, I found a course where you could study abroad for two years. And that was the only course in the country that did that. So I jumped straight on that. And I got to uh, live in America for a year. And I got to live in Berlin for a year. So it worked out really well, actually. And I kept doing art and graphics in my spare time. So I didn't neglect that. Hmm. What was it like living in America for a year? Oh, I absolutely loved it. It was like the only experience in my life, which was exactly like a movie. <laughs> Like every trope from every college film I'd ever seen was like, oh no, this is this is all true. None of it was made up. The one bit. Well, I'm glad we were able to affirm your stereotype. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, both of you have done a lot of different freelance work, um, but what is kind of interesting is you both have also done freelance work for Merlin Entertainment. Um, which for those who don't know, run things like Madame Tussauds and Alton Towers and Legoland, uh, especially if you're from America, like the Legolands are, are run here by Merlin. Uh, and we actually have a, a Merlin um, entertainment uh, headquarters here uh, near where I live. 
Um, what did you both do for Merlin? I, it's interesting that you guys did a lot of freelance stuff and finally kind of have these opportunities to work with companies that are sort of inside of theme park design. What did you both do? Um, I, I spent about um, two years with Merlin like in the um, offices in London in Acton. Um, and this was pre me working for Disney. And I, I just, you know, would do everything. You were, you were kind of a, an artist that would just be kind of pushed around the studio. So most of my work was for the London dungeons or the, the various dungeons around the UK. Um, then I also did work for Legoland and I did some, a very little for Sea, sea World or Sea Life, sorry, Sea Life. And I'm just trying to think what else, but just a, a bunch of stuff really for, for Merlin really. Uh, what about you, Rob? Um, I was mostly helping with graphics for some of their restaurant chains that they were in the process of refurbishing. So I think every time I got a brief, I was desperately trying to sneak some uh, Disney level theming <laughs> into there, probably spending way too much time going, whoa, okay, right, sit down. What's the part of the land? What is the story that is happening? How does this restaurant fit into this theme? And how are we going to convey that using text in a way that is appropriate to the environment? And they'd say it's chicken shop. <laughs> Um, hey, this is Merlin, it's chicken bud. Shop. It's called Chicken Shop. <laughs> at least you um, tried. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least my conscience is clear. In fact, I, I tried yeah. my best. You tried. Uh, but... <laughs> we love you for trying. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andy, I want to talk about a project which is even more interesting to me now that you mentioned that your sure. grandfather was uh, a part of Doctor Who already, which is, of course, that you, you ah. worked on London's Doctor Who experience, which is one of those things that um, like always I wanted to do before it closed. Um, as a big Doctor Who fan, I'm just curious, you know, how'd you come about uh, getting a part of that project and tell us a little bit about it? Sure. I mean, I was a huge Doctor Who fan as well, so it was it was really fortuitous for me. Um, I was I just finished working at Merlin and uh, there was another studio called Sana who was looking for a designer. I interviewed with them and I remember in the interview that I was interviewing with the kind of uh, one of the creative directors there and in his office he had all of these pitch boards with the TARDIS on them and it was distractingly so I mean they weren't <laughs> hidden they were kind of everywhere and you know we were talking this interview was going okay I thought and um, he asked me something and I, I just pulled something out of the air and said for example the TARDIS because it was in front of me and sort of did that and he kind of nodded and everything and then you know the next week I heard that oh yeah we'd love you to start and he said over the phone, and by the way, the first thing you'd be working on is is a Doctor Who attraction that we're doing. So I was like, wow, that's fantastic. And it felt really, like I said, fortuitous that I, I, I worked on it. Um, so I was kind of the lead designer on that with with the, the creative director, Mike, on that. And um, it was just a bit of a dream come true, as I said, because you don't always get to work with these fantastic properties. You know, you, you, you kind of hope that you would. I mean, for example, I'm still waiting on Wallace and Gromit and things like mm -hmm. that. But, you know, but Doctor Who was something that came about completely just by happenstance that I was just at the right place at the right time and really lucky to do it. But it was also an immensely challenging project to work with the BBC and to actually craft a story or an experience that people would um, get the most value for their kind of entertainment from seeing it, you know, going and experiencing a Doctor Who um, attraction. Because this was the first time Doctor Who had ever been an attraction. It, the first time it had ever been um, put into three dimensions as something that could, people could experience, you know, walking around, seeing a 3D movie. It was the first time it had ever been done. So the pressure was on us to deliver something that people would enjoy. Did you have an opportunity to uh, meet any of the actors or anything like that? Because you were sort of helping with the, you know, the overall uh, concept of the project. So I was curious how, if you got to, I, I'm trying to think who might have been in charge at that time, but the showrunner as well. Um, did you get in? At the time, it... it yeah, it was, it was, um, oh my goodness, the Sherlock guy. Uh, oh, it was Steve Moffat. Was, Mar was it Steve Moffat? Thank you. Yeah. yeah, Steve Moffat. Yeah, Steve Moffat was the showrunner at the time. And um, we had just got on as Matt Smith was incoming. Mm. So, um, and it was funny because there was quite a lot of the show that was held back from us. So I was brought in at a time very early on at the beginning and um, we were told that we were kind of very separate entities. So that the experience design was separate to the show, obviously they were, you know, working differently. Um, and we had to, as I say, we had to service the people who were the guests who were coming in who wanted to see, you know, what is, what is Doctor Who to someone? If someone comes along and, and wants a Doctor Who experience, you know, you kind of want to hit those iconic moments like the Daleks, maybe the Cybermen, but then there'd been more recent things like the Weeping Angels and um, a few of the, the newer monsters that Stephen Moffat had worked on, which were really you know captivating from the David Tennant era. So we, we wanted to touch on those, but I was kind of crafting this story and, and that was complete secrecy to the Matt Smith thing and, and what was going on in the story. So the BBC would trickle us parts of the of what was coming very, very secretly and quietly like oh, this. We might be doing this. We might be doing that. And there's going to be a new design for the Daleks. Just want to let you know that. So we were having to try and 
on a weekly basis work this into our designs and oh okay right we're gonna do a Dalek experience oh well okay there's gonna be these new really colorful Daleks and I should never forget when they first showed us in secrecy these Daleks and they were like what do you think and there were these blue yellow <laughs> really colorful massive Daleks and thinking oh wow okay that's that's really different isn't it yeah, <laughs> yeah okay right yeah so um so yeah and then we got to we got to meet matt smith we got to tour the the set in wales when they were filming so it was it, again it was a real privilege to work on that project mm. rob i wanted to ask you uh, some you've done so much work with uh, businesses like coca-cola and, and and holiday inn and even a soccer club do you have a favorite corporate gig that that you've done something that you look back and you go ah it was a corporate gig but it's it's something i i'm really kind of i take a shine to um probably my proudest one was for uh Ardbeg, the uh whiskey brand mm -hmm. because this sort of came out of nowhere and it was such a fun project and it's rare usually i find the more fun a project is the less time you have to work on it <laughs> like they'll either say we need you to do some tweaks to this menu layout uh you've got like eight months to work on it go for it uh or it's like we need to design like a whole land and you've got the afternoon so just go crazy <laughs> and you want to flip the amount of time you got for those but this was perfect because they were doing um they do uh an event called Ardbeg day every year and each time it has a different theme and this one was kind of groovy swinging 60s psychedelic so they'd uh bought a volkswagen bus and they wanted some psychedelic art to go on the side that relates to the tasting notes of the whiskey so spent ages working on sort of handwritten 60s gig poster type which has you know, the tasting notes like smoky and PT and cinnamon. And that got driven around the country to all these gigs mm. and uh, festivals. So I was so happy with how that turned out. And that was such a fun project to work on. Oh, that is awesome. You also do, that sounds cool. you do a bunch of really cool, fun side projects too. You have a ton of different things that you've done. Like uh, one of my favorites is your theme park liquor stickers. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> such as you have ones like Redhead Rum and Dr. Facilier's uh, Louisiana Absinthe. Um, how'd you come up with that idea? And, and, and did you uh do any research uh, when it came to labeling and things of that nature so this i think the idea came to me last time uh well one time i was in holiday in california i think and i sort of sat i always buy a notebook when i go on vacation because i always come up with ideas i just fill it with stuff that will tide me over until uh, the next time i get to go over and sort of soak up more inspiration but i just had redhead rum stuck in my head and then that led to this whole series of well, what if each attraction got an alcohol? What would be <laughs> what would fit thematically in terms of what the label would look like, what kind of alcohol fits, what the names would be? Um, but yeah, I had a lot of fun going into detail and research, finding out, you know, what historical rum labels look like and how I could marry that with these, you know, Disney icons and characters that I love. Is is there a favorite label that you have that you created out of that? Um, I do like mount mayday rum i do like that one and also tiki 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 tequila <laughs> both excellent both things that i wish i could actually drink too come on disney um come on licensing deal. yeah let's go um <laughs> andy you of course actually did work for disney uh you were uh at imagineering for about five years as a designer um how did that job come about how did you was it was it your experiences uh doing things like the doctor who uh experience that kind of got you in the door or how did that happen well, I'd been I'd been kind of interviewing um, and kind of on Imagineering's radar for almost eight years. Essentially, I think I've kind of sat down and, and thought about this. So it's about almost about eight years, and um, it was just fortuitous that um, when I was doing my degree, there was a lady who came in, and she was a she was a really good close friend of of our lecturer. And she was the uh, lead costume designer for the parades. So my tutor, of course, said to me, like, you're going to want to talk to this lady. You, you're really going to want to get to know her. She works at Disneyland Paris. So, of course, <laughs> like, like any of us would, zoom, make a beeline <laughs> for this person. Like, you're my best friend. Let me buy you lunch. Let's sit down. Let's talk. When can I work for you? You know, so it was, it was, so, you know, I, I just got friendly with her. She was a really nice lady. And she sort of said to me, oh, you don't want to be talking to me. You want to be talking to Imagineering. And I, you, you kind of do that. Right. Yeah, I guess so. You know, you're kind of leading the conversation. You know? <laughs> and who would that be? What would that do? So, and she put me in touch with um, two really, you know, amazing people. One was Peter McGraw, who I don't think works at Disney anymore, but who's a really nice, really nice guy to me. And the other was Kathleen Nunes in Paris, who's just retired, but she's been fantastic and a really close friend for all these years. Um, and I got in touch with her and she said, if you ever get a chance to come over to Paris, you should just come and share your portfolio with the team. So, I was on a train to Paris, I think the next week. <laughs> so, you know, um, just, you know, pull together a portfolio and went over to see them. And 
it was one of the most fantastic experiences of my life because I went over there um, on my own dime, as it were. And I, I remember saying to my wife at the time, if they say anything remotely positive, I'm going to lose it. Just so you know that I'm going to, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be a wreck. Just, just be aware of this. Okay. I'll, I'll be a puddle. You'll have to put me in a bucket and bring me home when you're a that way. And we were sat in a restaurant and, you know, Peter and Kathleen took us for lunch and they looked through my portfolio and again, I'm, I'm ready for the whole kind of critique of everything. And he said, Oh yeah, this, this is great. You know, I oh, was Irish. Sorry. That was my Irish. Accent. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. And, um, You've, you've definitely got what it takes to be an Imagineer. You know, I could see you being, and you know, I just lost it. Literally, I was, I was like, wow. And I squeezed my wife's leg under the table, like, oh my God, this is the moment. And the the worst thing, or the funniest thing for me was I'd actually done a, um, I'd, I'd done like an entry for the Imaginations um, competition. And at that time, anyone could enter, you could kind of like, you know, there was international relevance for it. And I'd said to my tutors, I said, I really want to enter this Imaginations competition. And this is my idea. And I really think it relates to theater design in these ways. And they basically said, uh, no, I, don't, I wouldn't have had to begin marking that. And theme parks are silly. So let's not do that. Let's do let's do Brecht. Come on, Andy, you're doing a degree. This is serious. This is London. This is theatre. Let's just forget about Mickey Mouse. So I was crestfallen, but I'd done kind of some of the work in my head and I'd, I'd done some of the concept images. So I took that to this meeting with with Peter and Kathleen. And Peter just said to me, literally just broke my heart in front of me, he said, um, we didn't see very good stuff this year. So if I'd have seen this, this would have completely won hands down. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like, oh. so bearing in mind at this point, I'm not an Imagineer and I have no intention of, there's no way for me to become a med, but I just thought if I had have had that opportunity, how many doors that would have opened for me. So I was, I was a little bit, I was happy, but crestfallen and I'd eaten some humble pie, um, which was tasty. <laughs> so I basically came back to the UK and, you know, I stayed in touch with Kathleen. She was wonderful. And um, long story short, she kept in touch with me. And once the Doctor Who thing had finished, I was looking for new opportunities after that. And she called me one day and said, I have a, I have, might have a job for you. So I thought, OK, I'm moving to Paris. And she said, how do you feel about Hong Kong? <laughs> so <laughs> um, so then I moved to Hong Kong and that was the beginning of my, really the beginning. Well, I'd done some freelance for her, like, you know, really small stuff. But that was the beginning of my imaginary journey properly. Mm. And did your wife also move with you to Hong Kong or was it was it a like a like a thing that you had at all of a sudden an international distance uh in your family oh no no we all moved yeah me and my wife moved there uh son was born in hong kong we were there for four and a bit years so yeah it was a, a proper big life-changing thing and and i would never forget saying to her coming off the phone call and she was like okay what did kathleen say and i said well <laughs> um <laughs> might be a job in imagineering she's like oh that's great fantastic you know where and i was like Do you remember how they just opened that park in hong kong <laughs> It's gonna, it could be there. So yeah. Um, so you know, bless my wife's heart. She just said, "Yeah, we should go for this." We were looking for that. We were looking for that opportunity. It just came along at the right time where we thought, "Yeah, you know what? Let's move to a really hot, sweaty country. We haven't done that. Let's, you know, we've lived in England where it's cold and clammy. So let's do that." So yeah, it was about six weeks later. We just completely packed up and we were dropped in Causeway Bay in Hong Kong in the worst month of the oh. year to move. Everyone said, "Oh, you know, I hope you guys don't move to Hong Kong in, in August." And we're like, "Yeah." There we were. The, uh, I think 15th, 15th of August, I was there in a white shirt and just drenched in sweat. Like, it's not always like this, is it? And I went, oh, yeah, yeah, it's always like this. <laughs> <laughs> what was I'm, I'm curious about Hong Kong's park culture, because it's um, it's so it's not only like its own thing, um, but it also is like, we, especially now that there's Shanghai, like it's this weird, like political thing, too. And, and there's just there's a lot going on. Um, what's, what is Hong Kong Disneyland like? It's really, Hong Kong Disneyland is really incongruous. So uh, the moment I arrived at Hong Kong, you know, obviously my, my Disney knowledge was, you know, fairly decent, like you guys, you know, as a fan, good, decent knowledge. Right. And I'd been to Walt Disney World. That was my first kind of foray. And that was the imprint of what, you know, Disney Arno and American parks are. And I'd been to Disneyland Paris. So I'd kind of seen international flavors of that, the refraction of Disney overseas, but I was really interested to see what's my first instinct of an Asian Disney theme park. And, and I knew that some of the things that gone on with the construction of Hong Kong Disneyland, but I thought, okay, I'll see this. And then it was really strange because I went to Hong Kong before I'd been to California. So mm -hmm. I went down Main Street and it's exactly, it's very much, in fact, it's almost identical to Main Street in California with the castle size. It is, it's lifted completely. So it was really strange to be looking at that. And, and then there's a there's a really gorgeous stretch of mountains behind the castle. So you see this castle and then these mountains. So the picture is completely different from California. So I was really like, oh, wow, OK. But it was it's quite small. It's charming, but it's small. And um, 
definitely the attractions were lacking um and it felt like a theme park that was just it felt like the Paul Presley theme park that I was worried it was. I mean, it's wonderful. I love it. I mean, and it has a place in my heart because obviously I was there for so long and we, we really tried to push everything into it. And you just, you do, you know, it does become, you know, your, your child almost. But at the same time, you know, I wish you could do better. You know, mm. it's like, because, you know, um, as I said, it, it was that Paul Presley, you know, cost cutting. When you look at what happened for Shanghai, when you look at what happens when you can, as a design agency, as a, as a multi-billion dollar company go, okay, we want to build a theme park. This is going to be for generations to come. And let's invest in this and let's not cut corners here. Similar to what they did with Paris almost really. Um, this was a park that was, you know, from the Paul Presley era of let's make something, but can we do it cheaper? And you know what, let's not worry about original design. What can we take the things that we've already done? Because that's already successful, right? Um, don't worry about the unique, don't worry about the Asian audience because, you know, we know what everyone likes. This is Disney, we'll be fine, right? <laughs> and so it was, it was a park of, you know, uh, inconsistencies and um, charming design and wonderful things, but it was also a park that was finding its voice, I think, and still at the moment is trying to. Mm. It's an interesting way to put it for sure. I am curious though. I mean, would, okay, this is a question as someone who has uh, <clears throat> been there for a while uh, and spent time in Hong Kong. Um, Mystic Manor is like one of the best rides Disney's ever made, right? Like, like as someone who's not experienced it and just seen it on on video, it it seems to be like for a culture I think that is at least a Disney fan culture that is constantly begging for original properties in the parks and things that aren't connected to IP. Like, it's like a crowning achievement of that. Like, what what was your experience with Mystic Manor and especially your first experience? Because um, uh, you were, I, I suppose, you were there after or they had opened it at the, correct no no i was there before oh, okay. um i was yeah, yeah I, I was brought on um to be a, a part for the base park design but also for toy story land mm. so they were looking because toy story land was running behind and they didn't have a, they you know in in the infinite wisdom of disney sometimes we won't need a merchandise shop oh no wait we do need a merchandise <laughs> shop <laughs> so um so I, I was brought in for that I, there was i was kind of plugging several kind of um gaps in toy story land and, and having a little bit of, of everything on on the grizzly and, and mystic kind of but mainly my focus was toy story land so i was brought on for that and then obviously the other lands kind of followed a couple of years afterwards but um we were really close to the team working on mystic manor and um i should never forget them showing us the model and just talking us through the scenes and i was just blown away just by the model and the animatics i, I mean i remember i think i remember tweeting something like you guys aren't going to be prepared for this and I'm, I'm sure i said something along the lines of this could be the best ride disney's ever done and everyone was like okay sure <laughs> but it was because that when they would talk through the show scenes and they would say okay there's there's 11 things happening in this one show in this in this set piece here but none of it you, you couldn't completely pinpoint each one and for example there's a scene at the beginning where where albert um opens the box for the first time and there you know the room goes black and the mystic dust tracks around the room in three dimensions and i really don't want to go i'm sure everyone who's listening to this knows it because everyone knows disney and they're, they're all very clever but i don't want to spoil it on this particular podcast to say how it's done but to see it done in front of you in the ride vehicle even when sometimes when you do know how it's done, it's magical because it does track around the room dimensionally right in front of you like magical dust. And then he's an animatronic who's a wonderful animatronic, like, you know, A100 animatronic. And it's just charming. The musical score by Danny Elfman is amazing. Um, the ride vehicles are trackless, which also add that extra level of, you know, dynamic movement around it. And it's it's just wonderful. And again, you know, for as a Disney fan, to see this wonderful um, original story that you've never seen before and knowing how it all ties into, you know, SEA and everything, it was, it, it did blow me away. Now, the, the final product really does deliver on all the stuff that we'd seen before. It's, I hope everyone gets to go see it one day. It's fantastic. Mm, for sure. Uh, Rob, I wanted to ask you about another fun project. This is one of my, uh, this actually kind of connects to Mystic Manor a little bit. Um, cause it's one of my favorite little projects of yours, which is the MTQ project. Um, <laughs> Tell people about the MTQ project because I think it's such a like it is something when you spend so much time walking through them and sometimes quickly you don't get the opportunity to enjoy them as much as you would like or maybe see the design elements. How did you come up with the MTQ project? Um, I think it came around because every time I'd come back from a holiday and be going through my photos, you know, I'd have all these the, the most captivating photos for me were the ones where there was no other people in it mm. <laughs> because to me those moments not that i hate people or anything like that but um it's those moments where you feel like you know it's this theme park that's designed to hold thousands and thousands of people but for that brief moment you've got it to yourself and just that moment of being 
in the themed environment, you got the music playing. It's just such a magical moment. And I can still feel that just by looking at the photographs of it. Mm. So I just started collecting them. Um, and then the collection just grew over time because every time I'd go to another Disney park, I'd get dozens more photographs. Um, had <laughs> went from annoying my husband because we'd be uh, trying to go somewhere and I'd say, wait, 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 I'm going to take a picture <laughs> down this uh, particular hallway because there's no one in it at this moment or we've just got up for a ride. But now I've sort of uh, converted him because now he's going, oh, you should take a picture down here because there's no one here at the moment. Yes. And uh, it got a lot easier at Disneyland Paris in winter because there was no one there. <laughs> so that's like 90% of my collection. And then uh, people start, because people know that I collect these, they'd start sending me them as well from other parks, yeah. which is fantastic, except I've got way, I've got such a backlog of photographs <laughs> to put on my website of these. And I'll get around to it someday, but it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's your retirement project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to say, like, uh, if there's ever been a time uh, for you to get a bunch of MTQ uh, photos, it's going to be right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, yeah. This is... Yes, yes. Albeit with uh, Perspex screens. Yes. Done in the yeah, that is, that's, yeah. it's a side yes. uh, part of the uh, overall portfolio. It's the, it's the COVID uh, designed versions. Um, let me ask you about uh, another thing that you sort of worked with with uh, Disney culture and Disney Twitter, especially. Uh, it's been really fun to watch uh, sort of evolve over the last, I, I think it's been over a couple months, which is the uh, the Armchair Imagineering Challenge, um, where other artists kind of send in new, their concepts uh, to little pitches that you have, like, you know, theme, a genetic spinner ride, things like that. What made you decide to um, kind of come up with that idea and what's that interaction been like uh with the, the overall theme park community oh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact like if there was one particular moment where i came up with the idea but it's just i i love theme design i like doing these little spec projects where you don't have a client to deal with apart from your own imagination and i thought it'd be a fun thing to put out into the community because i'm always seeing these incredibly talented people putting out all these bits of artwork and great concepts and i thought it'd be a great little thing and the timing was great because this was when everyone was going into lockdown and, you know, through furlough or other things, people had more time on their hands. And at a time when your entire news feed would be depressing news, like tweet after tweet after tweet, it was nice to see people using their imaginations and creativity and putting some positivity back mm. out there. Yeah. And the response, like it was beyond anything I imagined. I thought there'd be three people who'd answer it and that would be great and I'd be very happy with that me and my fellow theme park geeks but even the first one the response they just kept coming in and <laughs> I mean uh the video where Disney Dan and I were judging it ended up being I think it was three hours long or something like that the first one because we we wanted to judge every single one and people it turned out really like that feedback because once we put the video out saying giving our critiques, people would sort of take a snapshot of their particular 30 seconds and then post on their timelines and they were really proud of the analysis it got. So I meant, well, I guess that means we're going to have to do this for every single entry that comes <laughs> through. So <laughs> we had to make uh, challenges a slightly bit harder just to kind of bounce it out because, I mean, I can't spend 12 hours solid block on <laughs> Skype <laughs> as much as I'd like to. But yeah, and I think the most surprising thing is how I can take a sort of a challenge and in my head, there's probably two ways of doing it. And I can't really think of any other ways. I'm like, yeah, 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 let's see what they come up with. And like the range of themes and concepts and backstories that come back never fail to blow me away. Because we had one, the first one, which was uh, design a theme cart, uh, design a food cart for a haunted forest themed area. So I thought in my head, cool, it's going to be spooky. It's going to be like a carriage. End of but we had everything from a Wizard of Oz one, a Endor themed Star Wars food cart. And uh, I think my personal favorite was the one that was set 500 years in the future. And it was a converted ghost hunters truck now selling frozen mm -hmm. yogurt. Genius. <laughs> Uh, Andy, let me ask you about uh, one of the projects that you did uh, over at Disney, uh, which was uh, really interesting. I don't think people 
uh, overall know that there was once a Halloween overlay for the Jungle Cruise. Um, but mm. there definitely was. Um, and, and, and it's <laughs> unique in the sense that not only is it a, uh, like a spooky sort of thing put on, on top of this kooky ride, but also you're dealing with a, a culture that, you know, uh, for example, Mystic Manor's kind of there because ghosts are different, uh, in, in that culture. And so you're sort of how you deal with spirituality and how you deal with, uh, things that are scary is a little bit different inside of uh, that culture as well. What was that experience like? And, uh, you know, was it a challenge to balance out that ride's sensibility with these darker themes? Uh, well, the, um, the haunted jungle cruise just remains to, to this day, probably one of my favorite projects. And I worry that's going to be like the first line in my tombstone, you know, <laughs> like the, it's not a bad line. It's not high. a bad line. I guess not. <laughs> But it's like I hope I've still got some time left to do something that's that's as good or whatever. But um, yeah, it was it was the most fun project because um, it, the project came about because we were doing a blue sky in Hong Kong Disneyland. We went over actually went over to Glendale and then had the you know the second one back in Hong Kong, and the topic was just you know the the park really enjoyed Halloween um, as an event. It had been brought over from the US and really did quite well. And if for everyone who's seen the stuff that Hong Kong was doing before it was struggling with like its identity for, for Halloween. So the first kind of um, introduction to Halloween was kind of the very much Mickey and um, mini kind of Halloween trick or treat kind of thing. The cutesy kind of fab five didn't really read very well and didn't do so well. Then the, the couple of years after that were more terrifying <laughs> sort of, there was a sci-fi Tomorrowland thing. And there was like, there was something I remember someone showed me with these meat meat lockers or something like that i was like what is this this what so it was it was it was kind of two ends of that spectrum of of and you know the management to me and you know jalen sister who was the creative like the portfolio lead for, for hong kong at the time was sort of saying we've got to we've got to pull this in this this can't be one of these two things there has to be something in the middle there has to be something there's, there's disney there's a little bit you know, we definitely wanted to push it and be something that it, it hadn't been in the past. And I think we had more license in Hong Kong than we did in, in Florida and in California to do that. So we had this brainstorming session and Galaxy's Ghost Galaxy was the first to happen, actually, because it happened in Hong Kong before it happened in hmm. um, in California, before it was brought over. So that happened and had been a success. So the management kind of threw it to us and said, look, you know, these attraction overlays are good for us. Economically, they work really well. And, you know, creatively, what could you do with it? And um, someone in the kind of the blue sky said, you know, how about you know with jungle cruise could that could that be a thing and i was like instantly I, I was like oh my goodness in my head i was thinking that's that's great and i, I literally it's i think it's on my website there is a there is a, there is a postcard size i sketched this kind of jungle cruise boat with the skipper holding a light down in the dark kind of the light cutting through the darkness and there's this hand coming out of the water and it was just one of those things i was sort of sketching it i was going to say you know wouldn't it be cool if we did this and someone just said we need to we should really work this up this is great this because this has legs kind of thing so i was going to put in in charge of developing that as a project and it was a blessing and a curse because you know when you have an existing jungle river cruise that has the story beats of the savannah the lost safari and things like that and then you're trying to overlay a unique story to that it was a real challenge and because we didn't have as much of the i couldn't access as much of the teams for Hong Kong because we were a smaller team. So I kind of did the show writing and the, the storyboarding for it. And, um, and as you say, you make a really good point there that, um, ghosts from our, from our research at the time didn't translate as well into, into Hong Kong culture. The fact that there was more of a reverential, there, there wasn't kind of, if ghosts came out from tombstones like Casper and things like that and Haunted Mansion, that could be perceived as being almost, you know, um, disingenuous and, and slightly offensive to people, you know, that there, there is a different kind of uh, connectivity emotionally with that. So, the one the, what I tried to push for was more creepy jungle, um, you know, um, almost like curses, mm -hmm. really. So it was more like kind of mystic. Man. It was mystical. It was it was the fact if you were a bad person, did bad things, bad things would happen to you. Kind of like this guy, um, uh, Garrett Reed. So G Reed. <laughs> there we go. That's the pun there for everyone. Um, Garrett Reed was this explorer. And, you know, he was he was a bad guy. Basically, he was the antithesis, as I kind of pitched it. It was the antithesis of Indiana Jones. So he was like, you know, that thing should be in a museum. You know, it was he was the opposite of that. He was the bad guy. So he was trying to take these three emerald stones from the jungle 
and that would give him immortality. But of course, the jungle claims him back, essentially. So um, so that was it. So basically, I, it didn't really too much, hopefully, touch on those kind of themes of ghosts and spirits. It was more to do with, you know, bad things will happen to you because, you know, this curse will kind of draw you back in. But it was... So basically, the scene where, in the original show, where the hippos come out of the water, obviously, we wanted to replace that. And we thought that would be a fantastic scene to have this really eerie dread where the boat could stop and you'd have this kind of light, you know, take on the water. So we replaced the hippos from their existing kind of uh, mechanisms and we replaced them with these vine creatures. So these things would literally kind of come out from the water with their arms kind of, you know, craning up towards the boat. And it was just, it was, when we tested it, it was a really fantastic moment. The whole team were, it was kind of creepy because it was nighttime. We had this light and this torch. And yeah, like I said, I really can't believe we actually managed to pull it off. It was such a fun project to Mm -hmm. work on. Uh, As we finish up here, guys, I have two more questions for you. Uh, And I think these are a little challenging. So hopefully... Uh, you have some thoughts. Uh, oh, wow. The first one, of course, is uh, as you know, big theme park loving designers. Uh, what is your favorite Disney theme park design? Disney theme park design. You mean like an individual? Whatever. Element, I don't want. I don't want to like tell you what is Such whether a big it's question. whether wow. it is a ride or a land or a, an entire park. It can be whatever uh, really tickles your fancy. Ooh. That's a big question. Uh, see, I would talk about Tomorrowland 1974, but I did that at length on our Good podcast. Plug. Good so plug. You can hear I that podcast, like... <laughs> Sorcerer's Lounge podcast, now available on iTunes. <laughs> Ding. I feel that, yeah, that would be uh, kind of uh, covering already very, very well covered territory. Um, I like Grizzly Peak, I'd like to talk mm. about because I think Grizzly Peak might be one of my favorite lands out of any Disney theme park anywhere. I like I like making big bold statements, <laughs> even if they may not be entirely true. But I think it's that's one thing they really got right, even you know with the rest of the sort of shortcomings of that park. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. Now all the trees have grown in, you know you can feel completely in that Yosemite fantasy that you're there. Um, and to the original uh, queue loop mm. for Grizzly River Run because they had mm. a local radio station. And Andy knows this because we discussed it, but I love it when they can take elements and tie the whole land together like they did in Tomorrowland. Mm. But they had a, like a local radio station and they talk about an upcoming event in Grizzly Peak and they'd have an advert for a vegan restaurant in Grizzly Peak. And they'd have an advert which was done by Margin Ed, who owned Russian River Outfitters, <laughs> which, of course, is the gift shop for Grizzly River Run. And it tied everything together really nicely. And actually, one of the coolest little um, Easter eggs was they'd have a phone-in call, and it was Bumper McFarren who works at Grizzly River Run, so you could hear him over the speakers calling into the radio show. (laughs) So cool. What about you, Andy? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to pick one thing. I mean, uh, I'm just a huge fan of, obviously, Epcot for me, and um, it it would seem kind of logical for me just to say Horizons. I I mean, I I could just say that to you, just Horizons, and that would be my, you know... (laughs) It could be the answer for anything, I think, and people would accept it. Pretty much. And Journey's Imagination, but... um, I, I, I guess I just have a real soft spot for the Tower of Terror, Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, because... um, you know, as Rob knows, I'm a huge fan of Rod Serling, the, the kind of the guy, the writer of that. And just, I think he's a fantastic, intriguing figure mm-hmm. as a person. Um, but I think the Tower of Terror um, is really a wonderful benchmark of things that Disney do well, Disney Imagineering do really well. Because essentially, I mean, you know, you could take that anywhere. That is essentially a drop ride. I remember when people started talking about it when it first came out. It's just a drop ride. And you could take that experience and put it anywhere. For example, going back, kind of cycling back to what we talked about in a UK theme park, you know, in somewhere like Northern Towers. And it would be great. It would be a drop ride. People could see it and people would do it. Fantastic. You know, job done. That's the, you, you know, you tick that box of being an adrenaline rush. Thanks very much. But for something that Disney does, and when, you know, we talk about the adage of immersion and stories, let's just use those buzzwords for a second. But that, <laughs> that, that really does deliver on those things, because from the moment you walk down Sunset Boulevard, the palm trees are lined in a certain way to align your, your, your view to see this tower. It's angled to a kind of, you know, 40, 35 degree kind of thing. It's eerie. It's decrepit. And you see this elevator door opens and you hear these screams on, on the wind. It's like, huh. That draws me to want to go see it, but I'm slightly unsettled about that. And I have a fear I might die 
but you know, I want to go see more. And as you get closer, more of the details start to take effect. And then you walk through this decrepit kind of garden and there's this old fence and things. And then the fiber optic sign, which is just amazing. Kind of you see the, the, you know, the logo of the attraction come there. Like, okay, this is, and you know, you see the bellhops at the front in their costumes. So you think, okay, this is the 1930s. This isn't present day. And then when they had the misters on in the garden and you, the light was kind of coming through the, you know, the uh, cypress trees, whatever. And again, now you can see this, this hotel, but now it's up at you. It's looming over you. This kind of angle is coming down again. You can see these elevator doors opening and it's, these screams are louder now. And it's like, right now I'm, now I'm actually quite scared. <laughs> Should I just turn around and not do this thing? And again, everything in front of you, everything around you is, is showing you this was, and this is a hotel. They've actually physically built a real life size hotel and, you know, everything is decrepit. And why is the fountain dried up? And why is the plaster running? And then I can hear this music, which is kind of watery and echoey. And then you go into the lobby and it's dusty and cobwebs and, and something happened here and it's just been touched. And so at no point has anyone explained to you and said, just so you know, this is what's happening. Nothing's been said, but you know, in your, as soon as you got to the library, if you said, what do you think is happening right now? You'd, you'd sort of say, just from the purest perspective, you go, I think I'm in the past. Uh, and I think something bad has happened <laughs> and I'm fearing for my life <laughs> right now. So, and then you go into the lobby and then you go into the boiler room and you do this amazing experience and you come off and you've had the time of your life because you didn't die and you've the, you know, the quarters of the, you know, the adrenaline has kind of hit you and it's fantastic. And then you want to go do it again. And I think it's just an overlooked attraction in a way that I just love it as an attraction because it just, it really does hit all those beats of, of what does, what Imagineering is wonderful at, you know, delivering a great story, delivering a little bit of a thrill and everything in between mm. of that. Now let's ask on the flip side, if there's one design change uh, you could automatically, no uh, questions asked, well, get approved at a Disney park, what would that be? Off you go, Rob. <laughs> I put the people mover back in Disneyland. I mean, done. That's the only way it's going to happen, I think, at this point. <laughs> you just, unfortunately, in this yeah, mystically order. demand it, yeah. Uh, it's just so sad because not only is it gone, you've still got the tracks sort of as a grim reminder, it's kind of like just having a body <laughs> lying there. <laughs> so at least if it was gone, gone. Uh, well, if anything goes from Disney Park, you hope it's replaced with something better because then you can kind of get over it. But if it's never replaced with anything, it's just kind of there. And then I have to keep annoying with my husband by pointing <laughs> out, yeah, it used to go through there. It used to be this uh, speed tunnel. And he's like, yeah, you told me this the last four <laughs> yeah. times we came here. Like, no, no, no. See, it goes through there. Back here. It was really cool. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, no, I'd say br bring that back. You can make it so cool. You can put in new show scenes. Um, yeah, just do it. And it adds kinetics to the land, which it definitely needs oh, nowadays. Sure. Well, for me, um, again, I thought I, when I thought about this at the start of our conversation when you, when you said, and it does tie a little bit into me because I think I would probably change Disneyland Tomorrowland. I would literally close that and start mm. again. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think, I think the, it, it's a massive, at this point, there's not small pieces of design that need to change. It is a massive design scythe needs to come through that land and, and have a harmonious, you know, um, iconic storytelling, you know, vision to that. Um, so that for me, I think I'd love to have a go at doing Tomorrowland Disneyland, the classic, you know, wonderful Walt Disney retro Tomorrowland that could be something that's that's fun and aspirational and fantastical for, for people in, in Walt's Park. But then I also have a real uh, lack of affinity towards the Tangled Restaurants. So I probably... <laughs> <laughs> Not that they aren't amazing, you understand. They're really great restrooms, but I'm like, you built a facade of the Snuggly Duckling and this tower and the restroom. So that for me is always kind of really <laughs> wrangled with me. <laughs> I, I, I totally get that. I totally, it's, 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 yeah. it's like someone put icing, uh, on like a brick. Cause you're like, this is, there's all this wonderful. <laughs> now I'm going to go into this door yeah. and it's going to be a ride and no, it's a urinal. This is not what I called. Yeah, totally. I literally heard a guest out there. There's this young guest a couple of years ago when I was when I was working there, and we were just looking at something to do with Smallwood. We were looking at the facade of Smallwood for some project or something. And then she walked past and she went, "Oh, mommy, are we going to get to meet um, Rapunzel there?" And I, I kind of, like, oh, he's like, "Oh, not." <laughs> it's like, so yeah. Oh. So maybe on a break. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe on a break. But that to me was just the, the real kind of issue there. The fact that the perception from a guest perspective was something that was it was more than mm. it was, I think. And that was where it, it failed to deliver. Well, Rob Yo and Andy Sinclair Harris, thank you both so much for coming on DreamFinders. It's been a blast. Thank you for having us. That was really fun. Thank you so much. I had a really good time. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of DreamFinders. Thanks so much to Rob and Andy for joining me. And don't forget to check out their podcast, The Sorcerer's Lounge, available anywhere quality podcasts can be found. 
You can follow Rob's work over at robyodesign.com. That yo is spelled Y-E-O. And for Andy, you can check him out over at andysinclairharris.com. DreamFinders is edited by Shannon Mickelson with quality control by Ben Harris. It's hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Our podcast artwork is provided by J.P. Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by WDW News Today, the worldwide leader in Disney Parks news. Read all they have to offer at wdwnt.com. Tell your friends about the show and please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And also, if you or someone else you know would make a great guest on this program, feel free to email us at dreamfinders at wdwnt.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it.